impact. So imagine this. It's the early 90s. You're in precision rifle shooting, and you and your buddy are talking about top-of-the-line gear at the time. Things like the M14 rifle, the Remington 700, 308, and fixed 10 power optics. Your buddy mentions he's heard of a new contender on the scene from a company called Knight's Armament. Eugene Stoner has helped them create the SR-25 match rifle that's guaranteed sub-MOA accuracy out of the box, 1200 meter capability, and Special Forces is looking at adopting it for military applications. If you're like me, that would have caught my attention. Well, here we are 30 years later, and I've run across an unfired SR-25 match rifle. I hope to put those exact claims to the test. I want to share with you in a video my experiences getting to fire this rifle up and stretch it out at distance. What are these old rigs capable of? So this is a 30-year-old rifle with a fixed 10 power optic. We're going to be shooting 168 grain ammunition, and I've got 1,200 meters plus of distance. So I want to give you a look at what something like this which is very representative of the early 90s, would have been capable of. I'm super excited. If you like the sounds of it, stick around because I really think this is going to be an awesome video. So from here, let's move into a close-up look at the rifle and optic. Then we'll do a 100-yard accuracy test, and then we'll finish it off shooting steel. So here we go. Let's get started. Before we start shooting, let's take a close-up look at the rifle and optics package we have out here. As I mentioned, this setup is nearly 30 years old. It was originally produced in 1993, and in my opinion, represents the grandfather of the SR-25 that we know today, a very capable and refined long-range platform. You think about this rifle in particular, there's very few of them out there, you don't see them that often, and even fewer that are unfired like this one currently is. I felt like this was a really cool opportunity to give you a close-up look at what cutting-edge technology from an AR would have been in the early 90s. You think about precision rifles of the day, they were dominated by bolt guns. So in order for this rifle to gain traction, it had to shoot and it had to shoot well. So to do that, Knights equips it with a 24 inch, one and 11 and a quarter inch twist barrel designed to shoot the 168 grain ammunition. Knights was so confident they gave it a sub MOA accuracy guarantee out of the box when shooting factory ammunition available at the time. This rifle came with a 0.6 inch test target so it's very clear she's capable of shooting and I hope I can achieve that same kind of accuracy with federal gold medal match 168 grain ammunition that I'll be running. Move back to the gas block to me this is pretty neat and interesting because there are threads underneath the cap which is where the suppressor that was designed for this rifle would have mounted. So you think about current SR25s, the Mark 11 Mod 0, the M110, their suppressors all mount off of the gas block so definitely a trend that developed through the years with Knights starting right here. Forearm, just a round fiberglass free float tube, nothing fancy, it's very comfortable and I expect it'll work for what we're going to be doing which is long range shooting likely from prone position. Receivers, this is something I think is really cool. These receivers are extruded versus forged what they use today. What that means is there's no shell deflector on this, that actually was a Picatinny mounted option at the time or maybe a little bit after when this was created but what I noticed most important is there is zero slot between the upper and lower receiver they lock up extremely tight and the cool thing is the upper and the lower are both serialized so that you know it's a matched pair so extruded I think is really cool just in the fact that it is super solid I can't wait to see how it feels when I'm shooting it prone you move back from there the trigger is just a two-stage Knight's trigger, it's very crisp, very light. I think it's gonna work really well for precision rifle shooting. The bolt and bolt carrier, that's something I think is really cool. So if I drop that and we'll pull it out. You think about where we're at nowadays with sand cutter carriers, which have kind of little hashes in there. There is none of that. And then the bolt is just an old school single ejector design. And you'll notice it's a tiny ejector. So. Hopefully we don't have any failures to ejects, but this is where it all started back then. So kind of cool to see what this is compared to current. We'll drop that back in. As you can see, the charging handle is just a, an old school charging handle, nothing fancy going on there. The buffer is actually a plastic buffer, which is kind of interesting. And then the stock is just an A2 stock. Not the greatest for long range shooting, but definitely functional. And I don't plan to change it out because it is period correct. 
The optic is something I think is really cool. So this optic is a loophole Mark IV fixed 10 power scope with a duplex reticle. I have zero experience with the duplex reticle, not something I've ever thought about using for long range, but we will on this rifle. Pretty cool because at the time, Knights was actually selling the rifle and the optics together. You could actually get this whole setup from Knights. I think there was maybe three scope options from back then, and this was one of them. The turrets, these are pretty neat in that they don't have any kind of hash marks for mills or MOA. This is an MOA adjustable scope. It's the M3 knob, I believe it is. So it's one MOA increments, but this top turret is a BDC in meter. So if I'm gonna take a 300 meter shot, I'm gonna dial this around to the three. And in theory, that should be my dope for 300 meters. It's worth noting this currently includes a dial marked for 30-06. And in a document that Knight's included with the rifle, this is the correct dial to be shooting with the 308 168 grain ammunition. There's another dial that you can put on this for the M118 173 grain ammo. And there was a 223 dial and maybe a 300 Win Mag dial. So it includes a couple different dials that you could put on the scope for different BDCs. But with that said, I think from here, let's move down to 100 yards and give you a look at what I'm able to do with accuracy out of the rifle. These will be the first rounds through this rifle. Once we confirm zero, get a velocity, we'll move up here and we'll shoot some steel. So let's get this rifle fired up. So let's give things a go at 100 yards. I've got five rounds of 168 grain federal gold medal match loaded up. I've removed the caps off of all of my turrets, fixed my parallax to 100 yards, and I'm set to my 100 yard zero. So there's five dots down there. I'm gonna put this first five round group on the center dot and see how we do. Those dots are a half inch, and 10 power with a duplex reticle is not the best for groups. But let's see how the zero is and how she groups. A little bit high. I think that was five. All right, so she didn't lock back. That looks like an awesome five round group. First five rounds out of the gun. Let's go take a close up look. Yeah, so that group is just as epic in person as it looked through the scope. So let me throw the tape measure up there just to give you an idea. Easily, I mean, you're in the ballpark of a half MOA. That is pretty unbelievable for the first five rounds out of that rifle. If anything, we might bump the point of impact down one MOA but we'll see. The next thing I'm gonna do is run five rounds across the magneto speed to get a velocity. But wow, what accuracy. This is factory, federal gold medal match, 168 grain ammo. I'm gonna shoot at that upper left dot. We'll see what we get for velocity. I've got the GoPro running so you can see what the group does. And I'm curious what point of impact does with regards to magneto speed being installed. I've made no changes to the scope. Okay. There's a jam going on there. And now it really got it jammed up. Oh, let's try again. A little jam there. Velocity average is 2630 with an SD of 18. Not sure why we had a couple of little jams there. We'll have to watch that as we continue shooting, but uh, I think I'm going to bump the point of impact down one MOA, and then we'll go shoot steel. So let me show you the process of zeroing out this scope and give you a close-up look at what the turret looks like. So currently you can see one 
is where the scope is set for 100 meters. I'm going to dial down one minute, something like that. Now I'm going to loosen the elevation turret and spin it back to where the one is lined up. So let me loosen with the Allen wrench. And now the turret spins freely. I'm going to line up the one over the indicator mark. And we'll tighten her back down. And like that. With that, let's put three rounds through the rifle at the upper right dot to confirm our zero before we move out to steel. I've swapped to a metal mag to see if that'll clean up some of the feeding troubles we just had. Getting locked back. Looks like our zero is good. So let's move out to steel. So before we start shooting steel, let me give you a look at the targets and where they're located. There's three of them out there. So the first one I'm looking at right here is a 10 inch plate right at 500 meters. And then from there we transition kind of up into the right. There's a two thirds zipstick out there, 760 meters. And then there's a full size zipstick. If we transition all the way back to the left down the valley, and that full size zipstick right there is at 1,030 meters. So we've got several targets out there. They should be fairly challenging. Let's see what this rig can do all the way out to 1,030 meters. So how about we start with that 10 inch plate at 500 meters. The first thing I have to do is dial my elevation knob up to the 500 meter setting. I've got six rounds loaded up. There's a slight left to right. So I'm gonna favor a bit left, but let's see how she does. So I'm going to favor one plate width left of the target, something like that. So it dropped just a bit low, so I'm going to come up two clicks. When does look good? Impact. 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 Off the right edge. Impact. Great run, making easy work of a 10 inch plate at 500 meters. So two thirds zipstick, it's 760 meters. To make that shot, I'm going to dial up between the 7 and the 8, but I'm actually going to go on around to 8 because I was low at 500. So I'm going to start favoring kind of in the middle of the duplex. It's worth noting that duplex from center of reticle to where I'm at on the thick edge there, that's 8 minutes from what I measured earlier at 100 yards. So I'm going to start, I'm going to call it two plate widths left. Ooh, quite a bit low. I'm gonna call that, if that's eight minutes, I'm gonna come up four. All right. And I need to cut back my windows just a little bit. So one plate. Okay, elevation looked good. I'm gonna go dead on. The right edge. So just left. Impact. Impact. Looks like on the left edge. Cut that wind back. Oh, off the right edge. That's a tricky target right there, but we're two for six and windage was our trouble. I'm not ready to leave 760 just yet. I've loaded up five more rounds. Let's give it another go now that we've got the elevation dialed and we're close on the wind. This duplex makes it really hard to hold consistent windage. So 
I'm going to favor just off the left edge of the plate. Looks like that dropped low. Let's go dead on. Impact. I'm going to come up a minute. Impact. I think my light fell off. Impact. Impact. So, once we get the windage figured out, pretty easy to hammer that two thirds Ipsic. Let's finish this off with a full size Ipsic at 1,030 meters. Now, I've noticed that my BDC is not tracking that well in meters. If anything, it's actually tracking closer to yards. Like, for instance, right now, I'm about one minute short of the 900 meter mark. When we were shooting over there, we probably were at about 850 yards. So the BDC appears to be closer to yards versus meters, which it said it was calibrated in. But that said, I'm going to go up to 1,000 meters right there. And I'm going to add in another five minutes is all I've got. That's, that is the top of the dial in the scope. So. We'll see what happens. 10 rounds loaded up. I've got a wind flag down there that I can't see, but I'm going to favor left. One plate width. We'll see what happens. This is far for a 168 grain. Well, you saw it fall down there by the thick spot in the duplex. So I got to bring the duplex up the thick spot. Now I'm going to go a plate width left, just like that. Oop. Maybe not. Let's give it a go. Okay, you saw that fall way short. Or something like that. A little more wind, quite a bit more elevation. Actually pretty close, just off that right edge. Now we're just holding completely in space. Close. Man, if I had some reference points. That right edge. Impact. How crazy is that? Now it's going to do it again. Over the head. Didn't oh, that was an impact. I saw my light. I could not see that one. Pretty brutal holding out in space with a duplex reticle like that, next to impossible. So, a thousand thirty meters. Definitely, in my opinion, beyond the capabilities of this package. I think to get consistency there, I would need a more efficient bullet and a better scope. Not so fast on the summary. I actually remembered I had some 175 Federal Gold Medal match in the pickup, so I just ran back down to 100 yards, put five rounds on paper to check the zero, and it was fine. Also run it across the chronograph. And this stuff's running 2650. So faster than the 168 for some reason. I'm guessing because this barrel is probably sped up in the time I've been shooting it. But with that said, I want to run 10 rounds of 175 out there at the full size Ipsic at 1,030 meters. When I ran this in the app, it seems like this 175 should be flying about 10 minutes flatter 
So that should get me up closer to the crosshairs where I was. And we should still be supersonic. So I'm pretty optimistic we're going to have better performance out of the 175. So with that said, let's go ahead and dial back up to, I'm going to go to 1,000 meters all the way to the top. So plus the other five. And there's our target. There's our goal. All right, 10 rounds. And I'm going to favor about a plate to the left, just like we were. All right, top edge, left side. Couldn't tell. Definitely a first round impact, but did it hit the ground and bounce into the plate? Let's try it again. The top edge, left side. Yeah, I think it skipped into the plate on that first round. So you saw it hit the bottom of the Tipo, so I'm about halfway up. My windage looks good. Off the left side. I'm going to go dead on. Impact. Impact. I'm not sure what happened on that. It splashed to the right, but it might have hit the T-post. Impact. Not sure, maybe an impact. Definitely an impact. Impact. Holy cow. What a difference the 175 SMK makes. You can see with that bullet, this rifle is hammering at 1,030 meters. Now let's do a summary and we'll wrap up with my thoughts and experience shooting this rifle. So that's gonna wrap up the shooting portion of the video. Let's take a couple of minutes here and I'll summarize my experience getting to run this rifle. While I do that, I'd love for you to drop a comment and let me know what you thought about the rifle. Did it live up to your expectations? Were you surprised by the performance that I got out of this? Let me know. I love reading those comments and interacting with you. So for myself, I am super excited about the performance this thing laid down. You think about the accuracy claim of sub MOA with factory ammunition. I think we saw that at 100 yards is no problem, whether it was shooting the 168 Federal Gold Medal match or shooting the 175 Federal Gold Medal match. They both laid down beautiful groups. The first five rounds out of the rifle were easily sub-MOA and basically zeroed. I was actually shocked, and it's kind of a testament to this loophole scope. After 30 years, this thing is still apparently basically zeroed. Really impressed with that performance. Then from there, we moved out to the 10-inch plate at 500 meters, where we had no problems connecting once I dialed in the elevation and the windage. We pushed out to the two-thirds Zipsic at 760 meters, had a little bit of trouble in the first six rounds, but once I got the elevation and the windage corrected in the next five, we started stacking them in there on that plate. So beautiful performance at 760 meters. Then we pushed out to a full size Zipsic at 1,030 meters. If you remember back in the beginning of the video, I mentioned one of the claims around this rifle is a 1,200 meter capability. Did we see that today? Not exactly. And I hope to explore that further in future videos. But at 1,030, you saw the 168 SMK had a little bit of trouble, and I feel like it's beyond the capabilities of this package. So the 168 SMK, I had a couple of hits. I believe there was two of them, but a lot of misses. I was holding kind of down in space in that duplex reticle. It was really hard for me to get any kind of consistency. Then I swapped over to the 175 SMK, which has a much higher BC. It actually had a higher muzzle velocity, so I think my barrel was actually speeding up as I was shooting. But with a higher velocity, I was supersonic all the way out there at 1,030, and you saw much more consistent hits. So in my opinion, great performance out of the 175 SMK. 
And the longer I own this rifle, the more I hope I get to explore its capabilities. So in summary, I am really excited with the capability of this rifle. Now you saw in the video, we had some trouble with maybe some failure to feeds or maybe some short strokes. Seemed like it got better the more rounds I put through it. So I don't know if it's just a break in thing, but that's something I'll have to watch in time. I'll continue to explore different magazines, but overall the rifle I felt like performed really well. Now that said, this is a 30 year old piece of history. So compared to current SR25s, there's some quirks to this rifle. The first one is the bolt catch. I don't know if you can tell it, but this is basically an AR-15 bolt catch. It's tiny and there's kind of a fence around it that makes it really awkward to reach and utilize. Then from there on this side, the magazine release, there's a fence all the way around it. So it's really awkward to get your finger in there to drop the magazine. But beyond that, the rest of it is SR25. The way it feels, the recoil, the way it shoots is just like what I'm used to in my other rifles. The trigger is beautiful. What a great trigger in this rifle. Made it really easy to shoot those tight groups. The scope, now this is something else. This thing to me is just awkward and it represents old school technology. I'm used to shooting trimmer three reticles with 25 plus zoom. This thing is fixed 10 power with a duplex and a BDC knob. I'll start with the BDC. I don't think this thing is remotely calibrated, whether it was a velocity issue or whether this actually is not the correct turret to be running with the 168, even though the literature says so, it was not calibrated. It was off starting at 500 meters and it got way off all the way out there at 1,030 with the 168, which it's supposed to match. So something I'll have to play with in time is, as my barrel speeds up, does the BDC match a little bit closer? We'll see. The duplex reticle, it worked well for shooting groups. It was really fine, but it's hard to hold. There's no reference marks there for windage or elevation. So once you have to start holding, you're in space. So I guess something like this, maybe old school technology would have just been to dial the knobs, which I'm not really used to. I've become very accustomed to holding in a reticle like the Trimmer 3. So not impossible. And as you saw, we were able to make the hits it's just not what we're probably used to as a modern package. So that said, if you enjoyed this video and you've made it this far, I really appreciate you sticking around. I'd love you to help me grow this channel and it's your interaction that's gonna help me do that. So if you like this video, I'd love a like. Let me know in the comments what you thought. And if you wanna enjoy more content like this, hit me with a subscribe. I'd love you to join me on my journey. As we grow this channel, we've already seen a ton of growth so far. I got a lot of really cool stuff planned. So if you would, hit me with a subscribe and we'll join this journey together. The last thing is my Instagram is one of my favorite places to get to interact with you. I'm able to have conversations, share sneak peeks at what I'm working on and create relationships with each of you that watch the video and support the channel. So hit me with a follow over there. Now that said, stick around for my next video. I can't wait for you to join me and I thank you for watching this one.